This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. And uh, I think last recorded episode, we were discussing uh, serpent symbolism and, uh, you know, mythology surrounding that symbol. And now we're moving forward into a new topic, uh, but also related, as all of this stuff usually is related in some way or another. Planetary change, catastrophes, natural disasters. Uh, Right? Is that right, Randall? That's where we're going. I think we should delve into that for a while. Yeah. Crazy Decided. weather events. Yes. Yeah. And we need a context. I mean, especially with, uh, oh, you know, the political climate and the discussion, people need a better context to understand some of the claims being made back and forth. So I thought we could devote a few podcasts to looking into some of the things that might be considered kind of controversial, but, you know, we're always here hearing that we should follow the science so okay let's do that let's follow let's, the science yeah, see let's where it takes us. Mm-hmm. i'm all about it may not lead to where some people want it to go but we're going to give it a shot anyway it might lead to us being kicked off youtube <laughs> well <laughs> it might it might lead to us getting chastised a few yes. times we have plenty of warning banners already yes we do are we getting warning banners yeah you yeah. get YouTube comments about that pretty regularly. Yep. Tell me about that. I don't know. They are, they are, they are badges of honor. That's how you look at it. Every time you get a warning banner from YouTube, you're like doing it right. Okay. We're getting warning banners from YouTube. <laughs> are you yeah. saying, wait a minute, well, we have. So yeah. So what'll happen is we'll, you post a show and if YouTube, the algos are in the description or anything, they detect something that may be controversial. They'll put a little, a lot of times they'll put a link and say, here's the, you know, real story on whatever it is they think you're talking about and they'll provide a link to something really? to the authorities yeah to the authoritative statements of mainstream thought on that so, subject okay so in in regards to the subjects we've been talking about then what you're saying then is that the that the bona fide experts are weighing in <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah okay through well, the youtube algos yeah exactly oh okay yeah no, i haven't really looked it's like you know the U the UN IPCC has determined that global, you know, climate change is blah, blah, blah. And you should, you know, read here for that's before. right. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't gone back and look at them, but yeah, there's multiple videos that people, people comment that are flagged like that. Yep. But yeah, like Russ says, kind of a badge of honor. Yeah. Sure. It's like, but- okay, well, yeah, definitely listen to this. Yeah. So this is an algorithm doing it or an actual person sitting there? Well, I mean, something gets flagged somehow. Somehow, it's, but it's we don't a, know it's how. A, it's a black box six system, as far as I know. Like something gets flagged somehow. I don't, and I, I imagine that the, the little, um, banners that pop up down there are just automatically placed when the, when something is determined that you're saying something about climate change that may be, not you know part of the because everything official. everything official. is inst- instantaneously transcribed. Yeah, and it goes through a checking process as soon as you upload it. So that's what is it's you know it's transcribing everything so it knows exactly what's said so then it processes and says oh well this is uh they said younger dryas oh that's a that's a climate issue flag this one yeah so you think that <laughs> younger dryas is no, it's a trigger word or something i, I think it i think it's getting to be if well, it's not already yeah you know in the, discussing the younger dryas undoubtedly the words climate and change come up oh yeah and so sure, then, right. you know you can pick up on that and then um you know maybe it picks up on that no humans were around <laughs> for that to happen very few at least very few we know yeah. you know uh so, rapid natural climate change in the, yeah. in the in you know in the recent past not so, caused by humans yeah so what is it you're calling these things that the algorithms least, like you know just, just uh, say yeah, the, algorithms. The algos, yeah okay and that's just so we've got X number of algos, or we got X number of what did you? you the no, banners, yeah, the the banners, like the algorithm the is, what, is what flags the or notices 
something right. in the and show. And they put a banner the up there. Yes, that's right. Right beneath the that. banner. It's kind of yeah. the, the bots that run through and monitor yep. everything and read everything and yeah, yeah, and say, oh, this is controversial. Yeah. It needs this kind of, you know, notice. So, right. so it's not disinformation or misinformation or, you know, whatever yeah. the latest nomer right. is for the, for propaganda. So, okay. That's cool. So what we want to, we want to see how many of those banners we can get. Yeah. That's what, that's Ideally. a good goal. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going <laughs> the more, the more we get. Okay. Yeah. This one's got it already. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody in that. the comments that sees a banner on this, definitely say something. We'll see how many comments we get about the banners. <laughs> okay. So that's, uh, that's just weird. I guess I'm, <laughs> I'm out of touch here or something. That'll be easy enough to find. I'll, I'll send you a link to the ones that people, people are saying have that notice on it. So it's not because people who are listening are flagging something. No, it's coming no. straight from, okay. Correct. Yeah. But what would be fun is if you, you know, if you would follow up on the links and go see where are they sending people and what exactly is it saying, then we could talk about that. That'd be fun. Yeah. I yeah. would do. That'd yeah. be a good thing. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh. Randall reports. New episode. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Hey, well. So, yeah, we should talk for a minute about our recent excursion. You guys were there, weren't you? Sure. Yeah, Montana. man. <laughs> I, well, you got a I, shirt at least. I got this shirt. <laughs> I don't remember who gave it to me. Go here. There we go. Yeah. Oh yeah. Brad's got his too. Yeah, I, must not yeah, I was. I, I was at a. Di- I was at a dinner party and somebody came in and started handing out these shirts. That's what I remember. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Chief Cliff prominently displayed right there on the. Uh, I was just about Flathead Lake. Yeah, I was just about to ask Kyle, what's that depicted on the uh, T-shirt? But you knew, didn't you, Kyle? I do now, Randall. <laughs> you would have been able to answer that. <laughs> so I, somewhere, you know, I, you know. I, I did actually look into one of the U- YouTube, a couple of the YouTube chats, which, you know, I, I should do that more. I just, I, I have to confess, I barely ever look at that because it's just, I, I, I just zero time, you know? Um because sure, yeah. sometimes I do, when I look at it, I'll end up being in there like two or three hours, like reading right. through the comments and yeah. stuff. But, but the last two I looked at, um, after we got back from Montana, there was a couple of comments about me picking on Kyle. Yes, and, uh, I've seen those too. Yeah. Randall's <laughs> always picking on Kyle. <laughs> yeah. Hey, thanks for sticking up for and me I, out there, folks. <laughs> Unless they were like congratulating you for doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Keep remember. picking on that dude. He deserves <laughs> well, it. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, well, after I felt that, I felt a deep sense of guilt and remorse. <laughs> Over, I was overcome by uh, so lies. I made a commitment. Need a YouTube I made banner a commitment right now. Then and there, <laughs> Kyle, that I'll try not to pick on you so much. But I'm not making any promises. I'm just. I'll, I'll give it a try. But he's crying. But people need to understand. Look. <laughs> Thanks, man. This is how some guys in the old days, this is how guys used to, you know, proclaim their friendship by giving each other a hard time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, dude, they, they don't, they, the these days. people in the comments, they don't get to hear all the shit we give each other all the time. So, I mean, yeah. co- nonstop so, in the bus, I drove the bus that Randall was riding in, in the Montana trip. And I was just n- constantly giving him crap like all day. It was, that's like was. my favorite thing. That's yeah. true. He was. Yeah. And we were yeah. too. And he wasn't even the same bus. <laughs> <That's right>. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, not true. <laughs> Kyle does get props for the humor too. Uh, sometimes he slips them in and uh, they just yep. go unnoticed, but uh, yeah. people out, people out there are listening and getting their laughs in. So that's right. Don't stop. Oh, laughing. keep them coming, Randall. <laughs> keep them coming. You guys got a new uh, day in the sun camera is coming. view there too. I think that's a big improvement there. It is a big improvement. Yeah, we're we're trying out something new. We're using the um the iPhone yeah, itself. Using my phone. Oh, which yeah. means that I can't look up stuff. I'll have to look up stuff on the computer. Yeah. So, Randall, if you're making a demand for somebody to look something up, it'll have to be me. You know, oh, I can still do it. I can pull up the browser yeah, here. But then the we computer. can't see the maps. Yeah, and, you're right. You know, I can do it. He's trying to take over my job. Right. 
So, yeah, we had some crazy weather out there on our trip, really the first time. Uh, we've been lucky out in the desert, uh, Four Corners and in the Scab Land. It's uh, been pretty sunny and nice, but we got uh, two days, three days of uh, really constant rain there in, in uh, Spokane and then first two days in Idaho and then uh, got hailed on in uh, <laughs> yeah. Missoula, uh, marble <laughs> size hail. So, yeah, it's kind of good to lead into a, a weather-oriented uh, episode here. I have a great video of, yeah. of I was in my van videoing Randall standing outside of his van and he was just hailing on him. <laughs> just waiting and finally he's like he's kinda like, Okay, well maybe the hail's serious enough now and he starts heading towards the van and then I'm looking at his back and he's like you <laughs> 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 <He> got nailed. <laughs> Graham same way that was he was out there filming well, the hailstorm. Yeah, we had, yeah, it's the most serious one I've been in in a few years anyway, yeah. for sure. But, yeah. um, well, what was great yeah, was that, everyone was blaming Randall. <laughs> of course. They were like, That's Randall, right. what's the deal? Like, can you stop the, the Zeus thing right now? <laughs> like, what do you call we this made story? good money for this tour. We didn't yeah. sign up for all this rain and hail and there. inclement weather. But, you know, I look, everybody got out in it. I got wet twice and dried off. Yep. Um, no worse for the wear, but... You know, we stopped at um, at uh, Cabinet Gorge Dam, I think, was That's, our first real yeah. stop, wasn't it? Right. Yeah. That was impressive. Especially because, so the oh, other yeah. thing that, like, a along with all the rain, we were getting rain, having rain on us. They had huge floods right before we came up there, like right before the tour mm -hmm. started. So everything, all the rivers were up, all the lakes were full. Like there was, I mean, they were literally having flooding. There were huge logs floating down the river. The rivers were going, were rapid and wild. Waterfalls are gushing and the yeah. dams had the- Dams, all the doors were open. open. Yeah. yeah, big time. Yeah, yeah. that was, uh, it, yeah. It, I mean, how it appropriate was impressive. that we were out there, uh, you know, to study the floods. And then those first few days we got to see and remember, a Cabinet water, Gorge Dam, as we're looking, as impressive as that was, that water coming down through that, um, yeah. the pen stocks there and shooting out under pressure. What I saw there was exactly what I had been envisioning for the origin of Boulder Park. You guys huh. remember Boulder Park? When that water came shooting under the, um, the Okanagan lobe and it hit the channel of the Columbia. Yeah. And that high pressure water coming, shooting up, just like we saw at Cabinet Gorge Dam, yeah, shooting up, up yeah. and, and just ripping out, ripping out the walls of that cliff, that basalt cliff and all of that stuff getting splayed out over the, over the Waterville Plateau and right. is now Boulder Park. That's, that's what I, that was the, I, and you know, I've been trying to visualize that process. And when we stood there looking down at Cabinet Gorge Dam, I thought, yep, that's it right there. And it was amazing because the water was, I mean, it was loud. There was an incredible amount of mist and steam. And then the water mm -hmm. below the dam was, was turbulent. And there were all these crazy eddies and flows yep. and yep. waves splashing up against. There was a whole area around the side of the dam where you could see there was a big eddy that had cut, you know, when the flood was or way earlier when the flood was big, it cut it out of there. But we could watch the water. And then you're just thinking like, take this times like, I don't know, five 5,000 or 10,000, you know, whatever, several <laughs> orders of magnitude. <laughs> You know, you're watching this amazing thing and you're just like, this is tiny compared to yeah. what made this gorge. What we should say here is that this position, this is near the uh, mouth. So, uh, yeah, it's near the point where uh, just east of Lake Ponderé, near the uh, exit point of Lake Missoula, uh, r basically right where in the conventional model, the standard model, the lake water met the ice dam. And usually that position is centered pretty close around the current, the present position of Cabinet Gorge Dam. And so and that was actually right behind me. Yeah, right behind Brad. There we go. How the, appropriate. The, the dam is right back behind that hill there. Uh huh. So it's right. town of town of Clark Fork and the lakes out that out that way. And so Cabinet Gorge Dam would have been down to Brad's right. Kind of just off the, yeah, but down in the valley, somewhere right down in there. Yep. Yeah. So that, that recharge, that rain recharged all the, the streams and the waterfalls. So, um, 
And Ronald, I don't, I, I guess he probably told you, but yeah, he's a damn engineer actually that's been on several tours with us now. And he, he checked. And, uh, I think the, the rating he got was, uh, was estimated to be 90 to a hundred thousand cubic uh, feet per second coming through that dam. Oh, was okay. it? So that, I was confused on that. Was that max it could let through or was that what was coming through at the time we were looking at it? I think that was what was coming through as we were looking at it. Okay. That was my understanding. That's what we were witnessing, yes. Okay, so he was able to find an up-to-date, like, what, what they're letting through right now. Yes. Okay, yeah. So 100,000 cubic feet per second versus... Yeah, so given, let's say, the peak discharges of the, uh, the Cordilleran floods, as I'm rechristening them, or the Missoula floods there in uh, Spokane Valley, Rat Drum Prairie, just south of Lake Pend Oreille, would have been on the order of 7,700 times greater than the discharge we were witnessing. 7,700 times greater. How about that? How do you even wrap your head around that? Yeah. Nope. 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 And uh, I had... Still pretty small. I had a very similar overall take on this portion of the, you know, the mega floods tours. Uh, all that driving, all those miles we covered, and you're just in this lake basin. Every time you go through a, a, a mm -hmm. narrows and you come out and it's this massive valley that's, I mean, it's just, the landscapes in that part of the world are just huge and vast and the mountains are tall and, you know, there's, there's not a whole lot of trees in a lot of the places and you can see the strand lines way out there and it's just like, okay, this is insane how big this basin was and you're driving through the bottom of it and then you go through another narrows and then boom it opens again many 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 miles down the road and you're mm -hmm. still doing it and we you just it's like this is so much yeah it's been and it's only half of what is necessary to, to produce the floods we were looking at in the scablands it's like no no is, kyle not even half not even. well half not that half what's coming through uh in in it, what yeah okay south yeah of like Ponder A. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. It's like, yeah, we're under a thousand feet of water here. We're under 2000 feet of water. Yeah, right. Yeah. We're under 800 feet of water here. You know, just everywhere we went, basically we were at the bottom of a, a thousand foot plus deep lake. It's crazy. Yeah. So it's once again, it's far too vast. I think even to conceptualize while you're driving through it, it's in other words, mm -hmm. seeing it, for me, made me realize the vastness that is beyond my comprehension. That's what happened with the Scablands too. Yeah, it's like, you know it's big, and then you get out there and you're like, yep, it's, I knew it was big, and it's even bigger than I thought it was, <laughs> even when I, when I knew it was big, and now I know that it's too big. Yes. To really think it's about. It's too big. <laughs> and so, yeah, to correct, I guess to correct that, it's, uh, you know, it's half the, the I was talking about the, the guy who measured the flows from Eddie Narrows, which would have been everything from that basin that we were in. Yeah. Versus the flows from south of Ponderé. I don't remember where the, uh, what that place was and called. There wasn't enough water coming through Eddie Narrows to right. make up the flow down there. Yeah. To put it in, in turn, I mean, we could talk about cubic feet per second. We could talk about cubic meters per second. I like to talk about cubic miles per second because, you know, in. Yeah. You know, really almost what you need to do is you're going to need to, to come get your head around what one cubic mile of water is. You almost need to go out and stand on a prominence somewhere where you have clear view, 90 degrees in both directions, one mile. And yeah, you need a plane. It's pretty far. Yeah, you yes. need a plane need, a mile above you, yeah. You need something <laughs> an, an a mile above you, yes, <laughs> to picture, you know, I try to sell, I'll picture a, 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 an ice cube one mile on a side. And then you think one draining of Lake Missoula is 600 of those, just one draining. Yeah. God. But we're looking at multiple drainings because that water kept, and see, I mean, think about it. If we really wanted to cover the whole territory, for example, we would be up there in Boulder Park in Washington, and we would drive north hundreds of miles further up the Okanagan Valley, tracing the same damn flood. Yeah. We could do, you know, if we go to the north end of Flathead Lake, there at the south end of Rocky Mountain Trench, start driving there all the way up to Prince George. We're still in the flood. Yeah, it's crazy. The go, other great, the other great, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, you know, drive west down through the Columbia Gorge. 
There you are. The, you know, we, we haven't even done taking that in yet. At some point we got to figure out how to include the Columbia gorge in a tour, hmm. you know, because that is spectacular in its own right. And then make some side excursions up some of those, um, tributary rivers. Cause they're amazing and have these enormous back flood, uh, landscapes in them. Then you get down there to Portland. Then you go south all the way to the south end of Willamette Valley. And you got a massive back flood that has entered that valley loaded with icebergs. Those icebergs are loaded with erratic boulders. And then I think we talked about the, um, the Willamette meteorite, didn't we? Oh yeah. That's yes. man. The pictures of that thing are just. Now I see, and, 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 and what's wild that. about that is number one, it was in a cluster of basalt erratics and with some granite mixed in, which is undoubtedly from, the, from can, uh, Canada. Right. Yeah. So yeah. apparently you had basalt out of Washington, granite out of Southern British Columbia and that meteorite all being carried together on an iceberg that then back floated south into the Willamette Valley, came to ground, and then melted away and left that pile there. Like, hey, look at this. Yeah. How about this for some forensic evidence, huh? <laughs> yeah. So that, I, would, yeah. I would venture to say that the Willamette meteorite is probably one little speck crumb of whatever fell over the ice sheet. Hmm. You know, we, uh, we drove as a family up there and then on the way back and we got to take different routes cause we, obviously we drove to Spokane and then we left from Flathead from, um, from Flathead Lake on the way back. It was great because we went down by Salt Lake city mm. and got to drive through the Bonneville basin. Oh, yeah. Man. So yeah. after, after spending mm -hmm. all that time in, around the Missoula area and seeing all the strand lines and all this mm -hmm, stuff, then mm -hmm, we get mm -hmm. down in there and we start, we're like looking at these mountains way out there in the desert. And you're like, there it is, you know, and we're going through these catastrophic, what look like catastrophic flood on areas the north end of the basin, on the north end of the yeah. basin, basalt cliffs. Yeah. yeah. Crazy. Huge channels. And, and you get out and you're just like, okay, we're in a huge Valley and it's got strand lines way up on the mountains, way out there on both sides. And you drive, you're going 80 <laughs> miles an hour for hours and you go through another channel and then you come out and there's another one. You're like, wow, we're still yep. in the lake. Oh man. It was amazing. Such a great it, trip. It, 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 um, yeah, it kind of, uh, conveys a kind of a different impression of this planet we live on. And yes. And, and then to realize there's two realizations that kind of happen in tandem here. One is just trying to grasp this reality of these such enormous events. And the type of climatic consequences that would be implied by events of this scale, right? You're not just going to have some, some phenomena like this, this multi-state flooding. You were talking, look, we're talking Utah, Idaho, Montana, Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, Alberta, right? Nevada, yeah, Nevada, we got to include Nevada in that, right? Yeah. And that's just, yeah. yeah, exactly. So not only is it the just, you know, coming to grips with the existence of such phenomena and realizing that phenomena on this scale and magnitude are not some science fiction or fantasy or it's not some disaster movie. It's fucking real, right? That's, that's number one. Number two is that almost no one knows about it virtually no i mean think about how many people outside of our circle and some geologists have even the slightest comprehension of this kind of scale of events that we're talking about here no nope, hardly anyone hardly anyone people just aren't taking the time to cover the territory like we have and see the range like they're saying you know 80, 80 miles and then you go through another channel and then yeah there's still those shorelines out there they're yeah, still it's there huge it's huge 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 when i was in school learning you know about uh earth history and stuff it was like the ice age the extinction of the mammoths and all that stuff was just like a paragraph mm -hmm. yeah it was yeah. like yeah there was ice and then now there's not and now <laughs> and there's there were all these animals and now they're gone there was no focus Right. On that, that interval there between these two epochs that is so profound. It's that. Yeah. It's amazing that, that it's not 
uh, more broadly covered? Well, it isn't. And, and the, the surprising thing to me is, as I've, you know, had the opportunity to, uh, you know, to communicate or to, um, you know, to, to exchange ideas with professionals in the, uh, you know, in geology and related fields is that most of them don't really know either. No, most of them don't know the magnitude of these events. You guys brought in the Bonneville flood and, you know, we've been pointing at the Tammany bar, um, deposits and outcrop for multiple shows. We've, we've made reference to that and what that tells us about the, the temporal relationship between these two phenomena. Yeah. I kind of wish we would have diverted to go look at that. I didn't realize we were going to be going down into the Bonneville basin until too it's late. been scraped away that that exposure is no longer there yeah so we're gonna have to get them to cut a new one because yeah it's it's been it's call been up the quarry, become part of the quarry. <laughs> yeah it uh it's been sorted and scraped away hmm. yeah but at least we have photo documentation of the that's uh, right yeah we went there and well did we go there in 98 yeah, we were there the very first trip, very first trip, 98, trying to understand the connection and relationship between these two gigantic floods that are generally not, um, considered to have been, uh, have any kind of a common cause that they're two unrelated events, spectacular, but unrelated events, but, perhaps but they were, are they accepted to basically have happened close to the same time already or yeah, if close to the same time as, you know, a millennia or two. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's 12 or 1500 years. The thing that really gets me about the Bonneville flood is that that basin was maintained at a level for so long, meaning something, whatever the climate system was, the patterns of climate at that time kept enough rainfall to overcome evaporation of that basin. And then once it suddenly filled up 300 feet and overfilled the basin, after that, the climate was so different that it couldn't maintain its fill. So yeah, the fact that they place it further back than this change to the, the Holocene is strange to me because there would there have been... Is there evidence to suggest that the climate had shifted so much that it couldn't maintain the filling uh, of the lake? Here's what I would here here's what I would speculate. This is with 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 some knowledge of processes. Is that with as the ice cap grows, it's it's pushing the jet stream south, and when you get to the full mass of the ice, maybe up to a mile and a half, maybe even two miles thick, but certainly we know a mile and a half thick. It's causing major changes in the weather just because of its presence. It, and whatever the change in the climate was that allowed these ice caps to form, um, once they form, they then have secondary consequences. One, which is that the jet stream is pushed farther south. So that jet stream is now moving over these arid basins of the Western states and giving a lot more precipitation which caused a lot more lakes to form, a lot more greenery, and so on, right? Now, I think that there was probably a lake in the, a large lake, much larger than modern-day Great Salt Lake, for sure, in the basin of Lake Bonneville. But at its peak, Bonneville Lake was up to 1,000 feet deep. I would speculate that probably during the latter part of the Pleistocene, you might've had a lake in there that varied between two and three up to maybe five or 600 feet deep. But then the flood was a consequence of, of an anomalous filling, which would have been connected with an anomalous rise in lake level, which would have been an anomalous precipita precipitation. Prolonged, perhaps, I would think it was prolonged. And I would also look, and, and this is the work that still needs to be done, is the correlation, the temporal correlation of these different events. Because we can go into um, Chiricahua Mountains, for example, down in southern Arizona, flanking Arizona and New Mexico, and there's evidence of, um, of uh, massive erosion of the welded tufts that form the Chiricahua Mountains and Lake, um, 
you remember brad the name of the lake there we visited wilcox, playa. wilcox wilcox yeah will thanks brad wilcox playa which is a, a dry lake basin but we actually did go and find we found the shoreline we have pictures of us standing on the ancient shoreline so there was a massive lake that formed next to the chiricahua mountains that have this really extreme erosion on them and it's a that would be a very interesting tour to take um we could go over to the Jemez River. I have pictures of Brad standing up on six, seven, eight foot, really almost perfectly rounded boulders, you know, huge, like just channels choked with these big round boulders. And, and that's um, on the flanks of the Valles Calderas, which shows that, and then there's evidence of a rapid filling of the caldera and overflow of the caldera and the, and the down cutting of a major um, breach, uh, channel through the walls so i mean you could go over you know we could go over and we could show the evidence in the in this southern appalachians for some kind of intense precipitation events that would have occurred within that same window terminal pleistocene early Holocene. go up to new york uh all the way up the appalachians i mean we, we you know my point here is we go on and on and on we can find evidence for catastrophic changes geomorphic changes climatic and environmental changes what we don't have is a pr precise chronological correlation between these events. You know, are they happening separately and independently, or is the gigantic flooding in the Southern Appalachians happening at the same time as the gi gigantic flooding in Arizona or the, the spillover of Lake Bonneville or the cutting of the Finger Lakes? I don't know. But this is this needs to happen in order to make sense out of all this. We really that's what we need is a really precise chronology correlating all of these events in time. But we don't have that. So anything we've got, you know, and, and let's suppose it all happened at once. That's one extreme or it happened over a period of a few thousand years. And I don't think that any of the chronologies we've got so far don't precisely correlate anything, say, even to the to the century, much less say a decade or a year's time. But if it's a millennia, you still got the other sequences that all of these events, apparently from the dating of them would have happened within a two or three, or maybe a 4,000 year interval. Okay. So if you've got all of these incredibly huge, intense flooding events, which would require intense precipitation of events, if they're happening all at once, that's one thing. Are they happening? Um, independently of others separated say by decades or centuries if that's the case how do you explain that see we don't know yet we just don't have enough correlation between these phenomena but we do know enough to say that yeah everywhere you look around north america you can see evidence of these catastrophic events now to what extent can we connect these dots into a coherent phenomenon i don't know the answer to that but that's kind of where the work that lies ahead of us, um, you know, and, and either and you, way, either way, either one of those two extremes is going to raise extremely profound questions. You mentioned as many shows ago, and it's, it's kind of wild to think about that many geologists and it, and it may be most of them are really concerned with what's under the surface. Yeah. They're looking for oil, oil, or minerals or, you know, something to mine, uh, the stuff that's on the surface is like in the way, in the way, yes. they like ignore it totally. So, you know, there's a whole, there's a whole segment of geologists that don't even care about the surface features, the geomorphology, the, the shaping of, of those features that we look at intensely and, and love to see and realize what story they tell. And many geologists don't even care that they're there. I think more geologists are becoming aware of this. You know, I mean, we look, since we made our first excursion in 98, look what's happened. In 98, we went to, to make contact with the Ice Age Floods Institute. What did we find? Well, we found that it was one little old lady sitting in an office in a back room of the uh, Better Business Bureau in Moses Lake. Chamber that was it. Chamber of Commerce, yeah. In the in, Chamber of in, Commerce. In, in Moses was Lake, it. right. In Moses Lake. Now, how many chapters of the Ice Age floods? 
I don't think at that time had any, was there any geolo geologist guided tours that had happened? I mean, to the general public, like we participated in. I, I don't know up to that point, but I know the, the, the geological society of America regularly has like every three or four years, it seems now has their meetings, their annual meetings and conferences in Portland or Seattle or mm -hmm. somewhere. And they do tours of the Scablands extensively. I've been on several of them, uh, but mm -hmm. I don't know how much before that they did, you know, before, uh, Brett's was really vindicated and, it, you know, it became a, you know, something that, that obviously was a mega flood. Yeah. Well, there definitely were. I mean, I have papers that were, you know, the field guides for tours, but I think those tours were very limited. And I think that the group of them was probably like geology students, graduate students, things like that. I don't think it was much of a public kind of event. Well, no, you really don't think you had any of that. Remember right. when we went to uh, Buffalo, what was it? The Buffalo National Range. Bison Range. Range. Bison Range. That's it. The Bison Range. And they gave us pamphlets when we bought the tickets. Yeah. I remember I showed it to you, Randall. I was like, look at this. It looks like a, it looks like a brochure for our Scablands tour. It had the, all the places we've hit. Yeah. And that was, right. was it, was that the Ice Age floods people that were talking about that? What was that? I thought it was, yes. uh, yeah. Yeah. They had Palouse Falls and, you know, uh, Potholes Cataract and all that stuff. So. Yeah. They grew yeah. quite quickly. I, th I think it's kind people of scaled back some because, uh. You know, unfortunately, so many of the, the people that have time to, you know, pursue their interests are retired. You know, there's not really young people involved, hardly any, uh, you know, students are just scarce on those, on those tours or those trips. Yeah. So, you know, they kind of went through a, a phase of growth and interest. And I, I think it has, uh, you know, scaled back some. I think you're right. Yeah. yeah Cause those, those last couple of tours I went on, I mean, the median age was probably 50 or above above. Yeah. Yeah. There weren't that many young people on no, Typically um, I was one of the youngest people there. Yeah. So can you imagine that Brad being one of the youngest people there? <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're talking Must have been boring. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, I, but, I, I was just saying to say, if you don't mind, um, no, not at all. I want you to say, please going back to the, you know, was it one event or maybe, uh, multiple events that lasted maybe a thousand years or more. It wouldn't surprise me if it, if it was multiple events, possibly separated by a thousand years or a number like that, just based on the stories that have come down to us from the ancient, you know, the ancient past that it's almost like some people witnessed some crazy, uh, catastrophic event. And then later people who still had the memory of witnessing the one previous witnessed another one and this is where this second yeah. coming oh it's coming again mm -hmm, you know the mm -hmm. the idea that it's going to come again maybe that's where that comes from and then of course you know the idea of like the fifth sun and some mm -hmm. of these things like oh the egyptians saying we've seen so many yeah, destructions of the world so you see what i'm saying like if if it were to come to light that yeah you know, say from like 14,000, like Meltwater Pulse 1A, and that, you know, that these were like very sort of rhythmic catastrophic events, that that's where all of this, this whole mythos comes from. Sure. Absolutely. And, and yeah, and, and, and I do, I mean, I would lean towards a multiple, uh, sort of a, an epoch of where you've got well, you think about a, a, a like an earthquake. An earthquake might be preceded by four shocks. There may be several, you know, huge tremors, and then a series of aftershocks, right? But and, and even though you could say there's discrete four shocks and aftershocks, it's still part of the same event, the same phenomena. I see where you're going. Yeah, yeah, and you know, and and if we go back to you know the work of Victor Klub and Bill Napier and Asher and those guys, you know, and this which to me sounds more and more credible all the time that there are episodes or periods of, of, of concentrated bombardment epochs, bombardment epochs, if you want to call them that, um, then yeah, why not? I mean, now you've got a mechanism that could, that could uh, trigger multiple catastrophes over a few thousand years. You know, in a, if you've got a situation where you've got earth crossing a, 
a relatively young, fresh stream of meteoritic, meteoritic debris um, as a result of a disintegrating comet. And there's abs absolutely evidence that such a thing happened. You know, the Comet Enki, Rudniki, the, the Taurid meteor streams, that all of these are part of the same family of, of material that was uh, the consequence of this disintegration of this great comet, which I would speculate probably whose first arrival in the inner solar system was what triggered the final, what's called the late Wisconsin phase of the Wisconsin Ice Age, which goes back over 100,000 years. But there was clearly a major event that, that triggered or launched the final phase somewhere between 25 and 28,000 years ago, right? Because there was a major climate de, uh, degeneration from an interstadial warmth and a major retraction of the great ice sheets over North America. And then 26, 27, 28,000 years ago, somewhere in that climate cooled, glaciers expand rapidly. So that you now get to 21, 22,000 years ago, and you are in the full-fledged late glacial maximum that now sort of predominates somewhere between until about, I don't know, 15 to, to 20,000 years. And then it begins to ameliorate and the ice begins to shrink back. But there's one major punctuation mark in there if the dating is to be um, accepted, and that would be well, Meltwater Pulse 1A which is at about 14,600 years ago. So what triggered Meltwater Pulse 1A? I don't know. Impact? Yeah, and I, I always bring this up. You have George's Tusk, which is dated to like 30,000 years ago, and it has cosmic material in it. Uh-huh. So something caused that. 38 or 39. Yeah. Well, and that could, be, then that could be related to what I was talking about. Yeah. Because I went back to about 28,000 years ago. But, but see, the thing there is, is you got to differentiate between, number one, when does the actual climate trigger, right? right. And when do you amass a huge amount of ice? There's going to absolutely be a lag between, you know, yes. major development of, of huge glaciers and the climate change that allowed those glaciers to start forming in the first place. Right. Yep. Well, that's interesting. George, you're saying George's tusk is, was dated at 28 or 29? He said I mean, 38, 38 or 39. Close to 40. Yeah. So that's like yeah. a processional age and a half. Yeah. And then the Wisconsin you're talking about is like about a processional age. And then, of course, the younger, younger dryas is a half, half. Of a processional age. Yeah. Yep. Not age. I'm so, the entire, you know, processional yeah. year, the great year. Yeah, I got it. We're so, in trouble, um, folks. We're all going to die. Yeah, we're, we're having a long, unusual summer. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, yeah, so that's why um, we need an influx of fresh, young, talented minds and thinkers into, you know, the, the, the um, disciplines of Earth history and knowledge of the Earth. And I got to say this, you know, part of what's happened here is that geology has been replaced by um, essentially environmental geology, which is like a different animal. Mm -hmm. um, which is important and good stuff. Don't get me wrong, but like I, I can use the example of of Amory, where you know Julie got her degree and she she took geology over there, and it was like twenty years after I took geology. But you know, when I took geology, studying geology formally in in the university setting, catastrophism had just become more or less accepted, and that was primarily as a result of you know, the, the realization of the uh, impact geology. Impact geology was really pretty actively being studied and pursued throughout the 80s and into the early 90s. Um, you know, because at that first, that year, 1980, was when those three independent papers came out, all speculating uh, that the mass extinction at the end of the Cretaceous was caused by the impact. And of course, the one that was the, the most well known was the was the uh, uh, the Alvarez paper that studied the iridium deposits in Italy, and then that was followed by a, rapidly by a series of papers by other geologists and other teams looking at the same Cretaceous tertiary boundary. First, I think in in Denmark, then in New Zealand, and then followed up by 
you know, a dozen other places around the world. And every place they looked at the KT boundary, there was that spike of iridium. So suddenly it was not pseudoscientific anymore to think about, you know, world changing impacts. And then, but by the time Julie got in, th that had all been all the, the new catastrophism that was prevalent in, in my textbook was gone from her textbook and it was re replaced by environmentalism. And instead of learning about ice ages and the impacts and mass extinctions, she had to actually watch inconvenient truth twice in order to get her to not once once wasn't good enough, but in order to get her diploma, she had to watch it twice. So. Ah, Are hmm. you serious for the same class? Two different classes. Two different classes. Jeez. Yeah. In order to, to, yeah, in order to, to, to uh, pass, it was two different classes she had to, she wow. had to watch it. So she, she had to watch it twice. Well, I know we're, we're, there's now, a hell of a brainwashing going on. Yeah. We're planning to tackle some uh, climate events, uh, but we're right up on a break. So you want to take the break, come back and dive into that material? What do you say? Yeah. And then we'll start, yeah, we'll start laying out a, a, a map that people can use to try to really begin to understand the big picture of global change, of climate change, et cetera, planetary change, because that's all encompassed within planetary change. And then ultimately planetary change is encompassed within an even larger framework of cosmic change. So all right, we're going to be right. trying over, over several uh, podcast will be attempting to integrate these various magnitudes of perception. That sounds right. great. Let me, let me throw in here that, that we are going to do another Montana tour. This was our first one. So we got, uh, got some of the kinks worked out, figured out, you know, how much we can see, how far we can go during the day. So we're going to give it another shot next September. So September of 23 all sounds good to you. Um, get in on that trip. It's already, uh, dates announced on the contact at the cabin website. And that'll also soon be up on the RandallCarlson.com. And definitely we're going to the scab lands twice this September. So two trips late September of 22. So those are available also contact at the cabin.com and RandallCarlson.com tours and events. All those links are going to be in the description as always. And, uh, it's a great time. It's, freaking incredibly great people and amazing sceneries and uh just a good time for all so uh yeah come on out with us that's right if you don't want to hang out with kyle come the first week if you want to hang out with kyle show up the second week everybody's gonna be there on the first week <laughs> <laughs> all, right, all right we'll be, we'll right, be right, right back, back. yeah All right, welcome back, everybody, to Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. As always, want to mention our good friends over at CBD from the gods.com. Randall, you have yes, any sir. updates from uh, CBD? No, other than uh, I was sure glad I had it on the Montana trip. You know, that's when I really discovered I value the CBD oil, was when on the road. Because, um, you know, I tend to be an insomniac anyway. So. When I'm on the road, sometimes it gets even worse. So I found uh, I've been experimenting between, like, with your mom actually turned me on to some melatonin. Oh, yes. so yeah, that's I've good stuff been too, experimenting yeah. with CBD and uh, smaller melatonin. dose, smaller dose of CBD and then the melatonin. And, man, that third night, fourth night, boom, man, I slept great. Those first two nights didn't sleep so good, you know. For one thing, it's a three-hour difference. It's a 1,500-foot uh, difference elevation, and it's a completely different sleeping environment, especially because all these the hotels have these soft mattresses. Um, and so I'm used to sleeping on a four-inch futon. So anyhow, um, that third night with that CBD and the melatonin, oh, man, I slept good. There you go. And the fourth night, and good throughout the rest of the trip. Um, so that's, that's my story and it's a true story. Well, that's important. You got to keep rested up for these tours. Cause yeah. Oh yeah. 
a lot of time in a van and uh, more and more hikes and uh, a couple of waterfalls you didn't get to see on the Cumberland tour. So that sleep's a big one. It's a yeah. big one. Yep. Yeah. So support CBD from the uh, They support Randall. You support them. You support Randall. Uh, CBD from the gods.com with the um, promo code RC ships free to get you some free shipping. Help us help you help us all help ourselves. Yeah, I actually had a purposeful use for a CBD from the gods gummy just this afternoon. I came back and uh, had been summoned to jury duty selection. So I went down there. That can be a stressful thing hanging out and listening to lawyers and judges giving you the yep. instructions and you know what you might have to do and be involved in and uh earned earned my twelve dollars for showing <laughs> for showing up for the day but yeah you know just kind of takes that anxiety edge off if you got one of those and uh, of course driving cross country to these trips uh i actually had some uh helper drivers with me this time so listening to them chatter i had uh just chill out in the back seat. Uh, took a couple on the ride home too. So yeah, multi multi use for those. Yeah, and I can understand how you might have been stressed going in there, you know, into the courtroom with you know, hoping that they don't discover you've got an outstanding arrest warrant. <laughs> that would right. be stressful. Yes, one. Brad is an just one. Criminal. Oh, oh, there's more than one. <laughs> well, I knew there was at least three or four, but I didn't want to. <laughs> no, everybody, that's not true. Brad is not a wanted. It was reckless driving while discharging multiple firearms, but <laughs> we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> evil, evil Brad showed up once. Yeah, we try to avoid the subject of evil Brad on this program. That's why we feed Gre Brad the gummies. It yeah. keeps evil Brad away. <laughs> that was a smart move. Mm -hmm. And they work. I really like those gummies. So, uh, yeah, geez, let me take a drink here. I do like how, you know, on the trips, before we get into this main topic, Brad has his timing down perfectly for the Randall nap problem in the van. On the, on the radios, I noticed that right when Randall got like full. Finally! I'm, yeah, he's finally not, completely not. asleep. He's got, he's got full, full, nod. Nod, full nod nap <laughs> tilt. Brad pops up on the radio is like, Randall, do you want to talk about this uh, landscape <laughs> we're looking at over here? And Randall's like, oh, <laughs> yeah, like, oh, huh? yeah, like, <laughs> is he talking to me? Yes, yes, Randall. <laughs> Randall Radio. That's right. You noticed, Russ, you were there. You bore witness to this. I did. The uncanny timing. It's, yes, it was amazing. <laughs> Every time you got full nap, bam, yeah. he popped full up nap on the radio. Full nap mode. <laughs> All of a sudden, I'm being summoned. <laughs> That's right. From across well, the great. I'm expecting <laughs> if Randall was awake, he would be saying something right here. Yeah. Yep. So he must need to be rousted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. I, it, I guess that's logical. I, <laughs> oh boy. Here we go. So, oh, we're back now, right? We're, we're actually we're, we this are is, back. Yeah. This is official. We are officially back. That's right. Well, speaking of back, I want to go back to 1888. And some of the early writings about um, the Great Ice Age um, by a professional geologist, in this case, James Geike. If you look him up, G-E-I-K-I-E, -E, anybody wants to look him up and learn more about him, James Geike, yeah, he was uh, a very pivotal character, very pivotal um, contributions to the study of our planet back in the late 19th century, and he did a lot of really interesting work on the ice ages. He was particularly um, um, interested in that subject. So he wrote this book that came out in 1888. It was 545 pages. It was entitled The Great Ice Age and its Relation to the Antiquity of Man. And he, he, he made some very interesting observations that weren't necessarily original to him, but were being made in the late 19th century that raised some very um, provocative questions about the past and changes in the past. So I'm just going to read a, a short couple of passages out of the book, The Great Ice Age and its relation to the antiquity of man. Reference has been made to the fact that both in cave deposits and river gravels, 
human implements are found associated with numerous mammalian remains belonging to species, many of which are either now locally or wholly extinct. The appearance of these remains suggests many interesting inquiries, but at present I shall confine attention to one question, namely, what were the climatical conditions under which these animals occupied our country? The species naturally arranged themselves in three groups, the first embracing those animals which are either at present living in warm climates or which have in southern regions their nearest representatives, the second comprising animals of Arctic and northern habitats, and the third containing such species as inhabit temperate latitudes. So here's the problem that Geike was confronted with. He's looking at cave deposits and river deposits, and he's finding the fossilized remains of animals that lived in temperate climates, in um, Arctic climates, and thirdly, as he says, warm climates. So you've got warm climates, temperate climates, and Arctic climates, animal remains, of species that are endemic to each of these different kinds of environments. So in trying to explain how you have this commingling of these different uh, species that are, um, you know, products of completely different environmental circumstances, he looks at the idea of could they have been mass migrations of an Arctic species to a temperate zone or vice versa, or a warm latitude species to a temperate zone or to an Arctic. And the more he looks at that, the more untenable that idea seems to become. What would be the reason that you would have this massive migration of Arctic animals, say, to a temperate climate? Well, maybe that's a question that's still worth asking. But in any case, he does not believe that migrations, migratory uh, movements of these animal species could explain this commingling. So he says the theory of animal, an, annual migrations being, as I have tried to show, untenable, we can now only explain the remarkable commingling of northern, southern, and temperate groups in our superficial deposits by assuming that certain great oscillations of climate characterize the accumulation of our cave earths and river gravels. So in looking at this, using his term again, commingling of species within singular deposits, this was the conundrum with which he was faced and others of his time was trying to explain how this was brought about, right? So the, the question then becomes, were all of these species, we couldn't have assumed that they were all occupying this geographic area simultaneously, that would make no sense, right? Then clearly, if it was a southern climate or a temperate climate, you've got Arctic species, then how then can you rightfully claim that this is an Arctic species if its remains are not, in fact, found in the Arctic? Um, so he comes upon the, 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 this idea that, that this mingling of these species somehow must be related to climate change. And in his terms, he uses great oscillations of climate. He goes on and he says, nevertheless, proofs are not wanting of a former mild condition of things having prevailed within comparatively recent times in the far north of British America. Sir Edward Belcher brought away from the dreary shores of Wellington Channel, which is at a latitude of 75 degrees, 32 minutes north, which if we look on a map, I, I could pull it up if we want, but it's, it's, it's way north, beyond the tree line. He says that from the, the, the Wellington Channel, 75 degrees, 32 minutes north, portions of a tree which there can be no doubt whatsoever had actually grown where he found it. The spot where it was found lay about a mile and a half inland 
I give the account in Sir Edward's own words. He says, I at once perceived that it was no spar and not placed there by human agency. It was the trunk and root of a tree, which had apparently grown there and flourished. But at what date, who will venture to say? It is indeed one of the questions involved in the change of this climate. He goes on to talk about uh, his team of guys decided that they were going to try to look and find out the, 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 the circumstances of this, the existence of this tree in the permafrost. So as the man proceeded with the removal of the frozen clay surrounding the roots, which were completely cemented, as it were, into the frozen mass, breaking off short like earthenware, they gradually developed the roots as well as what appeared to be portions of leaves and other parts of the tree, which had become embedded where they fell, and now were barely distinguishable, at least not so much as some impressions on coal to the casual observer. When a warmer climate prevailed here, this tree possibly put forth its leaves and afforded shade from the sun, and most fervently did I just now wish for its return. So it was this kind of evidence that led some of these early geologists to realize, well, hey, we're in an Arctic climate here, but there were once trees growing where it's now permafrost and there's no trees. So clearly, what does that imply? It implies that the climate had changed. So it was evidence like this that really began to accumulate through the, through the 1800s and into the early um, 20th century that clearly seemed to indicate that there had been, to use Geike's term, certain great oscillations of, or rather, whether, um, yeah, I'm sorry, Geike's term of certain great oscillations of climate. So let's just jump ahead to 2001. And I'm just, I mean, I could draw from a vast array of literature here. I'm just going to pick one that I've got in my files. This is, um, Trends, rhythms, and aberrations in global climate 65 million years ago to present. Um, appeared in the journal Science uh, in 2001, as I said. And this is sort of a comprehensive um, overview of the sedimentary layers and what they of rock that have accumulated over the last 65 million years because sedimentary rock you know, is carries the imprint of the type of environment uh, in which that rock formed, you know, particularly if it's sedimentary rock. I mean, if it's, you know, it may have, um, it may be a, a sandstone that's formed from windblown desert sand. It may be a limestone that's from a shallow marine environment, you know, full of marine life and so on. It might be, um, it might be volcanic. Um, all of these things, are going to give clues as to the nature of the climate. I mean, clearly, um, it may be a lake environment. It may be varves from the bottom of the lake. It may be uh, sediment from floodplains of rivers. And then, of course, all of that is going to have uh, information um, encoded in it as to the environment of deposition, which then can, in turn, tell you more about the ambient environment. For example, if you have a lake in a... In a uh, you know, in an environment and, and streams are flowing into that lake, those streams are going to be carrying all kinds of life forms, um, both flora and fauna, the types of pollen and leaves and organic material um, that is carried by those streams or rivers into lakes, then gets deposited and becomes part of the layered bottom sediments. And so by taking uh, core samples of the bottom of a lake, you can look through and, and decipher annual depositions of uh, stream flow, which are usually pretty easy to see because of the fact that there are uh, typical patterns of seasonal change as far as the influx of these uh, freshwater streams into ponds and lakes and so on. So, I mean, from all of this kind of stuff, you can infer uh, information about the environment and the climate. So sedimentary rocks, not so much with metamorphic rocks or and igneous rocks. Um, you can you can tell you know what happened locally or regionally or even um, on a much larger scale by looking at lavas and basalts and things like that. But it's not going to tell you a whole lot um, about the actual environment at the time that that um, that that eruption took place. 
not so much like the, the, the sedimentary archives. So anyways, this is now a, a quote from this work, Trends, Rhythms, and Aberrations in Global Climate 65 Million Years to the Present. James Zakos or Zakos was the, the primary author. Mark Pagani, Pagani was the second author. Um, I think there was about six authors of this particular study. So through study of sedimentary archives, it has become increasingly apparent that during much of the last 65 million years and beyond, Earth's climate system has experienced continuous change, drifting from extremes of expansive warmth with ice-free poles to extremes of cold with massive continental ice sheets and polar ice caps. The last decade has witnessed, and this is published in 2001, so this would have been the, the decade from two, uh, of the 1990s, right? The last decade has witnessed a rapid growth in the inventory of high-resolution isotope records across the Cenozoic. The Cenozoic is the period we're now in, but followed the Mesozoic. It began with the great impact that, that severed the chain of life uh, 66 million years ago, ended the Mesozoic, launched the Cenozoic, and which saw the rise of mammals and eventually the appearance of hominids and then human beings somewhere around a couple hundred thousand years ago or longer. Um, so the last decade has witnessed a rapid growth in the inventory of high-resolution isotope records across the Cenozoic aided by the greater availability of high-quality sediment cores recovered by the deep-sea drilling pro project and the ocean drilling program. The improved perspective provided by these records has led to some of the most exciting scientific developments of the last decade, including the discovery of, and here's where it's relevant to everything we've been talking about through all of these episodes, geologically abrupt shifts in climate as well as transient events brief but extreme excursions often associated with profound impacts on global environments and the biosphere so we can see there that what i'm trying to show here is that over a period of of uh more than a century 120 years You've got the, the insight and research that is current and contemporary is actually confirming what these guys of 100 to 120 and 150 years ago were beginning to realize, which is that there are these, whether you want to call them uh, abrupt, geologically abrupt events or certain great oscillations of climate, what we have between then and now is an encyclopedia of information and scientific research that's been uh, conducted that demonstrates overwhelmingly the, um, the reality of massive climate and environmental changes, sometimes extremely fast, and orders of magnitude beyond anything we've experienced um, within the last couple of centuries that would encompass what we think of as modern civilization, which may go back far enough to uh, basically uh, correlate with the, um, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So I'm going to go back to uh, about 40 years ago, and when modern climate science was really get, beginning to get its footing, and there were two, um, two great founders of, of climate science that I, I like to quote, um, Hubert Lamb and Herman Flan, or Flown. And so what I'll do here is let me see if I can't share my screen and we'll do a picture of, uh, of um, Hubert Lamb. So people can see what this guy looks like while I quote him here. And what, oh, there you go. Oh, excellent. So this is the guy. So he was the founder of the climate research unit that became quite, famous and controversial with the, uh, remember the release of the climate gate about 10 years ago. The thing about Hubert Lamb is even though he founded the, the CRU, the climate research unit that basically provides all of the climate data that the IPCC uses. 
and then was embroiled in the controversy, the climate gate controversy when the emails between uh yes, phil right. jones and some of these other guys got released which we're going to talk about a little bit but not right now but so that that um institution that they work for is the climate research unit and it was founded by this guy here however what's interesting here is i suspect that if hubert lamb who passed away in as you can see in 1997 would be rather dismayed about what has happened politically in the institution which he established but people can make up their own mind i'm going to go i'm going to i'll start out by saying that the work of hubert lamb and and i'm going to quote him in the next next i'm going to kind of quote from this from his work um uh, but he is usually never referenced by the pro, the proponents of anthropogenic greenhouse warming or agw since it's to anybody who really follows his work would see that it's incompatible with the idea that uh, there was a climate stasis prior to the uh, advent of human influence. Um, so let's look at what he actually said back in the day when he was uh, founding this institution. He wrote this uh, paper called An Approach to the Study of the Development of Climate and Its Impact in Human Affairs. It appeared in the uh, the compilation Climate in History, edited by T. M. L. Wigley, M. J. Ingram, and G. Farmer. It was published by Cambridge University Press. Uh, ter- totally and thoroughly legitimate scholarly work. So let's listen to what Hubert had to say. Around 1880 to 1900, it was apparent from the first hundred-year series of weather observations that the climatic averages of that time were very similar to those of a century earlier. And it became conventional to treat climate as essentially constant. Accordingly, the study of the development and possible changes of climate was given a very low priority, or more generally, neglected altogether. Given these circumstances, it was natural that the general public and workers in other disciplines also ignored the possibility that climate might not always be so stable and climatic change might affect their affairs. Of course, this did not apply to occasional extreme events, but the incidents of these, it was generally supposed, could be treated as random. By 1950, however, it was obvious that the climate had been changing significantly during the 20th century, though in ways, now this is important, in ways which made things easier for most human activities in most parts of the world. Why did things become easier for most human activities in most parts of the world? He goes on and he says, there had been a general rise of prevailing temperatures with recession of the ice of the Arctic seas and increasingly rapid recession of the glaciers almost everywhere. There were fewer failures of the monsoons in India and West Africa, and rainfall had increased in continental interiors. A scientific explanation of global warming in terms of the effects on the radiation balance by carbon dioxide, which man was adding to the atmosphere, an end product of all the fossil fuels burnt, won wide acceptance. This left it possible to believe that climate had been essentially constant until the Industrial Revolution. If we will demonstrate the influence of the climatic development and shocks produced in the course of this on human history, we must look first at extreme cases. For this purpose, the record of the last thousand years is well suited because it seems to have included a notably wide range of climatic regimes. The high Middle Ages evidently saw a persistently warm climatic epoch which lasted until about 1300 to 1310 in Europe and affected about 
at least two-thirds of the Northern Hemisphere in the previous one to 200 years. A peak of warmth seems to have been attained a few centuries earlier in Greenland and much more of the Arctic. And cooling in those regions may have been responsible for an increase of storminess affecting the North Sea and perhaps much of the Atlantic and Europe after AD 1200. Now here it's important to note, okay, and this is as we go through this, you begin to see how this begins to add up. But well, it's important to note that there is this well-documented increase in storminess and intense weather events that followed in the wake of the global cooling of the Little Ice Age. Okay. The following centuries brought a series of changes, some of them abrupt, leading to the so-called Little Ice Age between about 1550 and 1700 or later, when the extent of ice on the Arctic Sea and of ice and snow on land seems to have been, very important, seems to have been greater than at any time since the last major glaciation. The changes of winter temperature amounting to a fall of the 50-year means of 1.5 degrees centigrade between the 13th and 17th centuries appears to have been accompanied by similar changes in other seasons. These changes imply a shortening of the average growing season by about a month and the decline of almost 200 meters in the upper limit of productive cultivation of crops in England and presumably in other places at about the same latitude in Europe. 200 meters, that's, you know, over 600 feet. So what that's going to do now, of course, is by removing, air, you know, all of that cultivatable land um, for 200 meters, that's going to take a lot of aerial expanse of viable agricultural land out of commission. Okay. The fossil evidence and many actual reports of advancing glaciers in most parts of the world in the Little Ice Age period have been cataloged by many authors. For example, in Iceland, Norway, and the Alps, the records include the overrunning of farms and farmland by the glaciers, as well as disasters from avalanches, landslides, and the bursting of glacier-dammed lakes. Even in Ethiopia, there is evidence from Portuguese travelers that the snow line came down on the highest mountains and in eastern equatorial Africa, the glaciers on Mount Kenya and Kilimanjaro were in more advanced positions than their present limits. The advance of the Arctic sea ice had already, by the 15th century, isolated the old Viking colony in Greenland from all contact with the outside world. And the European population there died out. In the late 17th century, a further advance of the ice caused Iceland to be surrounded and cut off in the extreme year 1695 AD, while a recent study indicated that in that year, the polar water reached the entire coast of Norway, and for 30 years, it dominated the ocean surface between Iceland and the Faroe Islands. This meant that the ocean surface in that area was about five degrees centigrade colder than in the present century. Now, that's pretty significant by itself. Five degrees centigrade colder is going to be about eight degrees Fahrenheit, roughly. Doesn't the, uh, I don't want to go off on a tangent here, but doesn't the sort of legendary search for the Northwest Passage get involved with this? Like the, the fact that there was too much sea ice? And people, the explorers up there kept getting trapped. Yes. The ships would get stuck. Yes. Right. But then eventually as the ice receded slowly over the centuries there, you know, it became open enough to travel there. So interesting. Yes. All right. So that's, that's some of the words of, of Hubert Lamb. Okay. And so he clearly is seeing that there have been some pretty considerable changes in the last millennium. Okay, then let's move on to, uh, are we seeing Herman? Well, we are seeing Herman. 
Okay. These two guys, Herman and Hubert, they lived, they were almost the same time. Let's see. Herman was. It was 13 to 97, I think, or he was 85. So yeah, real close. Yeah, real close. All right. So Herman wrote a book, uh, was called the climate of Europe past, present and future. He, he was, had an enormous voluminous output of writings on, on climate, uh, climate change and climate. Um, this was part of the atmospheric sciences library published by D Rydell publishing company. Um, it's chapter two climate in the last thousand years subtitled natural climatic fluctuations and change. So here's Hermann climate, even under its natural development alone varies continually each year, each decade, each century, each millennium since long before any question of impact of human activity. It is important to gauge the magnitudes and timescales of these variations since planning should not be based on expectations of return to some non-existent norm. And the magnitude and extent of any changes attributable to man's activities, or even whether any such effects are occurring on more than a local scale, cannot be determined without knowing the range and the likely timing of changes due to natural causes. Extension of the record to earlier times by systematic use of the numerous historical documentary reports of weather available in Europe, as well as various forms of fossil or proxy data, indicates that the last thousand years saw a particularly great swing of the prevailing temperature level of more or less global extent. And this was accompanied by other changes, for example, of the wind and rainfall regimes that are largely determined by the global temperature level and its distribution. There was a long period of more or less sustained higher temperatures in this part of the world between AD 900 and 1300 or later, followed by a period of regression and glacier growth until uh, between about 1550 and 1850, when there was probably the greatest extent of mountain glaciers and sea ice in both hemispheres since the last major ice age. There are some points of interest about the geographical extent of the warm and cold climate regimes, which respectively affected Europe in the early and middle to late centuries of the last millennium, the medieval warm epoch seems to have extended over nearly all of North America, the North Atlantic, and Europe in the 12th century. At that time, information from the highest northern latitudes seems to indicate that the Arctic generally was still enjoying a mild regime. Evidence from the Southern Hemisphere at that time is sparser, but there are indications of warmth in New Zealand, roughly contemporaneous with the warmth in Europe. And it has been supposed that the wave of Polynesian and Maori sea migration between about AD 600 and 1300 coincided with a time of warmth and higher sea level attributable to some melting of glaciers and ice sheets giving more water clearance over the coral bars at the entrances to their island in the lagoons. There is more evidence from the last millennium. From both oxygen isotope work and forest studies, it seems clear that New Zealand underwent a sequence of temperature changes broadly paralleling that in Europe. Now, I think the implication I'm going to and make an aside comment there that the implication of that is clearly contradicts the notion of those who are arguing that the medieval warm period and the little ice age were not global in extent. I think we can go back 40 years and we can find extensive evidence 
from that time to this, that the medieval warm period, the, the, uh, the, the preceding dark ages, cold period and the, uh, succeeding, um, or subsequent little ice age were all in fact, global in extent. From the variation of the glacier, back to, to Sloan's quote here, from the variations of the glaciers in Chile and elsewhere, including those near the equator in Africa and New Guinea, it seems clear that the colder regime of the Little Ice Age centuries was virtually worldwide in extent. From a variety of evidence, it seems that the colder climate, particularly in the 17th and 18th century, was, and this is, this is extremely important, that the colder climate was subject to a wider range of year-to-year -year variations than the present century. The variations, and the quote, he goes on, the variations with which we are most concerned for planning purposes must be those on time scales from a single season up to 100 to 200 years. But it is worth noting in connection with the century-to-century -century prospect that a recent survey by Wigley et al. in 1979 indicates that each of the last three millennium has produced a period of colder climate and advancing glaciers in its middle centuries after a warmer period around the beginning, the beginning of the millennium. The longer term variations also are therefore of more than academic interest. And then I'm going to quote one more from around the same, from the 80s, uh, John M. Grove, who wrote sort of the definitive work on the Little Ice Age, um, published by Routledge in London and in New York in 1988. Climatic changes come on several different timescales between short-term fluctuations lasting a few years and changes extending over thousands of years. There are variations over a few centuries which may have profound effects on natural phenomena and human affairs. It is variations on this scale, stretching over several generations, with which we are concerned in studying the Little Ice Age. It was a period which may be seen as beginning in the 13th and 14th centuries, and then, after an interval of more clement conditions, culminating between the mid-16th and the mid-19th century. It was also a period of lower temperature or mo over most, if not all, of the globe sufficiently marked to have had important consequences. For several hundred years, climatic conditions in Europe had been kind. There were few poor harvests and famines were infrequent. The pack ice in the Arctic lay far to the north and long sea voyages could be made in the small craft then in use. Communications between Scandinavia, Iceland, and Greenland were easier than they were to be again until the 20th century. Now, we're talking here about the medieval warm period, you know, 900s, thousands, 1100s, the period in Europe that was associated with the great cathedral building era. Icelanders made their first trip to Greenland about AD 982, and later they reached the Canadian Arctic and may have even penetrated the Northwest Passage. Ah. Grain was grown in Iceland, and even in Greenland, the northern fisheries flourished, and in mainland Europe, vineyards were in production 500 kilometers north of their present limits. But the beneficent times came to an end. Sea ice and stormier seas made the passages between Norway, Iceland, and Greenland more difficult after 1200 AD. The last report of a voyage to Vinland was made in 1347. Life in Greenland became harder. The people were cut off from Iceland and eventually disappeared from history towards the end of the 15th century. Grain would no longer ripen in Iceland. First in the north, and later in the south and the east. As the northern winters became colder, fish migrations took different tracks, and life became tougher for fishermen as well as farmers. In mainland Europe, disastrous harvests were experienced in the latter part of the 13th 
and in the early 14th century. With famines in England in 1272, 1277, 1283, 1292, and 1311. The years between 13 and 14 and 1390 saw harvests fail in nearly every part of Europe. Extremes of weather were greater with severe winters and wet summers. In consequence, the boundaries of cultivation contracted. In these late medieval times and in succeeding centuries, the impact of climatic fluctuations was felt most painfully and persistently in highland areas. Cultivated areas suffer, suffered especially in the uplands of oceanic regions. In the last few centuries, glaciers have advanced in the mountains of Alpen Europe and Scandinavia, in the Northlands, and indeed in most other moist and cold parts of the world. In the decades between the late 16th and late 17th century, European glaciers swelled and their tongues advanced, destroying farms and damaging mountain villages. Streams fed from glaciers flooded more frequently, sometimes catastrophically. In many areas, this kind of hazard was compounded by landslides and avalanches triggered by increased precipitation and the greater glacial activity associated with it. So it paints. There's a, like, is there an implication here that within certain limits, a warmer climate is just more stable in general and overall better for human civilization than, you know, than a colder one that it's more stable somehow it has yes. more it, it's got more energy to, that's how what it has to be to be warmer but like a lower energy climate a colder one is less has less stability within you know a certain range i'm sure that would change if you got yeah there have to be thresholds for yeah. both of those because if you get completely cold it's stable it's yeah, cold it's totally stable right yeah, but if that once you get to that level of coal, you're screwed. Right, everything's Absolutely, dead. Absolutely, but yeah. just talking about stability in terms of like the energy input into the climate. Yeah, so, it's just an interesting idea. Yeah. It's just interesting to think about it that way. That, thinking that, of the thresholds being like once you add so much energy into it, then it becomes maybe more chaotic. Like there, are, there's got to be thresholds. Yeah, I don't know. There's got to be thresholds, right? Yeah, but so as we're, a we're, rule. Yeah, so we're, what we're what we're looking at is like there's a there's a specific range uh, that most climate is within on Earth, at least that we know of, and in that range, it's the higher energy uh, state that's more stable. That's just really yes. interesting. Yes, yeah. yeah, that is interesting. As we're getting to the wrap up here, let me let me circle back then to Herman, uh, back to his the climate of Europe, past, present, and future just to try to put a cap on this um, and some of the lessons we need to derive from it. So he goes on to say from 1300 onwards in the course of the changes, which ushered in the little ice age, the climate became now this, I, we, we just were quoting from Gene M Grove, right? Now we're back to um, Herman Flown. He says from 1300 onward in the course of the changes, which ushered in the little ice age, the climate became notably erratic and underwent a number of sharp variations from decade to decade, as well as from year to year. The variability and the occurrence of extreme seasons of various kinds must have borne very heavily on the primitive agricultural economies then existing. And it is clear that there were severe effects on the health of people and animals and in diseases affecting the crops, the most fearsome episodes of the times in these regards were the visitations of the Great Plague, the Black Death, as well as the occurrences of sheer starvation and of ergotism, a disease of claviceps purpurea, also known as St. Anthony's Fire, contracted from bread made with flour affected by the ergot blight of blackened grain in damp harvests. The warm climate of the 12th and 13th centuries in Europe can, to some extent, be traced back to the 10th century. And in the long tree ring species series of oaks in central and western Germany, 
At that time, also, farm settlements were spreading up to 200 meters higher than before on the hill country of Norway and doubtless elsewhere in Northern Europe. Cultivation of the vine was also spreading further north in many parts of Europe and ultimately spread to greater heights than today. In the 13th century, and probably right from A.D. 1000, wheat was grown as far north as 64 degrees north latitude in Norway. Cultivation spread by the 1280s to heights up to 320 meters above sea level in northern England near the Scottish border, actually to 425 meters in southeast Scotland. The same century has been described as the golden age in the history of Scotland. In Europe, the first signs of serious climatic disturbance came with a number of great wind storms and sea floods over the low-lying coasts, for instance, around the North Sea. In the 13th century, the reported drowning of 100,000 to 400,000 people in some of these incidents places them among the worst ever recorded weather disasters. The advance of agriculture and the northward and upward spread of vineyards on the hills of Europe seems to have ceased about 1300 to 1310. In England, the cessation was abrupt, coming as it did after a few decades in which the spread had been vigorous. And it is clear that, apart from the great storms at sea and floods of the low-lying coasts in the 13th century, the first bad climatic shocks came at this time. Of the period 1693 to 1700, in Scotland, there are many dire accounts from parish records in the old statistical account. In the upland parishes of Scotland, it was reported that one-third of the people died in those years. Many were buried in mass graves, and whole villages disappeared. These experiences, bitterly described at the time in Old Scottish Parliament, probably made the union of Scotland with England, which took effect in 1707, inevitable. In Iceland, parish records report that whole farms disappeared under the increasing glaciers and ice sheets at this time. And at various times between about 1600 and 1850, there was great alarm among the villages and farm communities in the Alps and in Norway over the advancing glaciers. Many pastures and whole farms and villages were, in fact, overrun. There we go. Okay. There it is. The Mer de Glace, Glace uh, this is an example of a, a valley being overrun by a Little Ice Age glacier. We can go through and look at some of these. You kind of get the, the uh, here's, here's, so here's the, the, the print from, Oh, oh yeah. probably the early 18, late 17, early 1800s. And then a photograph that would have, I think, been taken in the 90s. And so you can see the arrows pointing oh, out wow. here, the high marks. Oh, yeah. Here's the important thing, though, that people need to realize. This glacier recession did not begin in the last few decades. It began at the end of the Little Ice Age between the early and mid 1800s. And has been ongoing since. Let's go here. You see this is Little Ice Age Moraines in Svalbard Island. Well, so here we are on Svalbard, looking at Svalbard. And you see the moraine, the, the oh, yeah. very oh, yeah. clearly, that's the Little Ice Age Moraine. Okay. So interesting perspective here is during the Great Ice Age, this valley would have been completely filled with ice. Mm. That is gone now. And during, and then, uh, during the Little Ice Age, this was the extent to which the uh, valley glacier extended out, you know, the tributary valley extended out onto the plain. And then it's receded this much between its uh, max maximum extension and its withdrawal at the time this picture was taken, which was probably early mid 90s. Yeah, look at that. But this is, you know, this is pretty, pretty evident right there. Yeah. You know? I love how you can see it's transporting all that material in it too. Yes, of, yes. Yeah. 
all of that material is being, well, if you look up here at the glacier itself, you see that it's. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. The yeah. lines of sediment, it's pulling through it. Yeah. Yeah. That's really awesome. Yeah. So then there's a lot of these paintings. Uh, I think we'll look at some of those next time as well. But um, frozen during the Little Ice Age, when uh, this is this one showing the frozen canals of Scott Holland, which doesn't occur now. Ah, here we go. Look, mm. growing out under the Gap Valley floor. Yep, it's going to take over that farm. Yeah. Wow. And then this this is a good one because it shows the the retreat. This is about 1775 to 1780, about to overrun this church. And then this is about 1966. So if we go back and forth here, you can see the valley and the ice is retreated up to this level here. It's, you see the ice up here. And so now you can see that the, what was previously under the glacier here in, in, uh, you know, 1780, this all forested across here now. And of course, this is 1966. So all of this, the bulk of this glacier recession took place in the latter half of the 1800s and, and first half of the 1900s. And it's only like in the last decade or two that carbon dioxide is acknowledged to have been uh, concentrated enough in the atmosphere to have affected uh, any kind of measurable global warming at all. So this glacier recession proceeded by many decades. Now, the, can that can that the recession also be caused by lowered precipitation in the collection areas, or will that? Oh yeah, it, yeah, I okay. sure it can. Yes. Okay. All right. The Argentier Glacier, as it appeared in 1780, you see it approaching out here, and you see the village here yep. and the farms. This caused a lot of anxiety to these I people. Bet. Yeah. Watching was... this get grow day by day, moving in like it's going to wipe out yeah, their existence. crushing trees, making noise, like groaning yeah, all night. Yeah. 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 It sounded like a monster coming out of the mountains. Yeah. Yep. So this is about 1780, and then here's a photograph from 1966. Mm. Look at there. So it's gone. You see, it's completely receded up. Yeah. The whole area is becoming reforested in here compared to, to here. So this is an That's what I'm talking about. Look at that. Yeah. Okay. So you're bringing up the pictures I was just mentioning. It's like, the, I've seen some of this. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah so, Glacier's totally gone. Yep. Look at that. <laughs> I thought that must Thor have been destroyed all the ice giants. Yeah, what happened? Odin. 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 That's who it was. Yeah, Odin. <laughs> uh -huh. He destroyed the ice, giants. the ice giants. That's yes. right. <laughs> and then here's Southern Alps of New Zealand. This is a good one. This is um. Oops. Use that arrow key, Randall. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Stop using your mouse. There you go. And Br and Kronos has put his hat on, so we got to wrap it up here. Okay. Well, yeah. Look at that, man. You know, just find a good ending point. Yeah. Three fifths. Of, well, we got about four more or five more images. We'll just breeze through them here. And you can see the recession. So here we are, uh, about 1872, 1905. And so this is recession, major recession that's taking place long before any thought of carbon dioxide induced gl a global warming. And here we are, 1940. Uh, yeah. So it's, yeah. So this map, the, the majority of this glacier recession took place prior to World War II, and all sides concerned to this with this generally conceded around World War II and in the immediate thereafter was when carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere may have just reached the minimal amount necessary to affect any kind of noticeable or measurable warming. Got yourself a nice proglacial lake there. Yep. There you go. Proglacial lake. Yep. About ready to burst out at 700 million cubic <laughs> feet per second <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then diagram showing the recession of Franz Joseph glacier from 1865 to 1965. So that's, you can see here, highlight oh, the high yeah. 1865 by 1907, by 1930 and, and by 1950. 1950. Yeah. And so the, the recession of glaciers that has been measured in the last 
20, 30, 40 years is a continuation of recession that has been going on since the mid 19th century. And it's important to provide that context in order to try to come up with any understanding of what it is that's happening. The coldest centuries in 8,000 years, the Little Ice Age causes and human consequence. The coldest century, now, as we conclude, let's just keep this in mind. When we're, if, if we're looking at the coldest centuries in 8,000 years, and then we have any warming at all relative to that, it's going to appear, it's going to appear anomalous, right? But when you look at the big picture, there's nothing. What's anomalous is the cold weather Not that the we're warming. using as the baseline. Right. Yeah. Ice fairs on the, on the frozen Tim's River, which is not frozen over. What was it since? I got it in here, I think. Yeah. 1804 was the last time it froze over. It has not frozen over since. The Tim's River in England has not frozen over since 1804. A woodcut wow. illustration of the 1684 Frost Fair on the River Thames in London. We've seen that. This is an interesting. It's the same valley. We go from here and watch. And the glacier. It's completely gone. Completely gone. This That's is, amazing. Yeah. Isn't it? Look at this again. So Little Ice Age. And now, now, as far as the folks living in this valley, which environment would they prefer? This <laughs> or this? Yeah. Well, you might want a fortress, fortress of solitude beneath that glacier. You never know. <laughs> yeah. But only one person can be in the fortress of solitude. So. Yeah. Here you go. Just at the turn of the century and in 2008. Wow. Same here, from this to this, mm. from this to this. This so this is this is nineteenth century. This is early twentieth. Lyle Glacier. Oh yeah, eighteen eighty three to two thousand thirteen. So, yeah, you can see here. This is like mid eight, mid to late eighteen hundreds. I don't have the exact date, and this would be more or less now. And you see the the lake that's been left up here. Notice a a an ice dammed lake. Mm -hmm. Yep, I see it. Yeah. And then this glacier filling this valley, and I believe this is a lake in here. I'm, and this will end with this this graph because this shows. Uh, the average length of 169 glaciers from 1700 to 2000. The principal source of melt energy is solar radiation. Variations in glacier mass and length are primarily due to temperature and precipitation. So there you go, Kyle. That answers your question right there. Temperature and precipitation. This melting trend lags the temperature increase by about 20 years. So it predates the six-fold increase in hydrocarbon use even more than shown in the figure. So here you see what's happening here. Between 1800 and 1850, there's a, there's a trend, and this is the shortening of the glaciers here. Uh, normalized glacier length, you see. So using this as 1700 as your zero baseline, you see here... Uh, Meters no, it's going, times it's, yes, it's going negative as it goes up. I going think. negative as it yeah. goes up, exactly. Okay. So dash line before hydrocarbon increase, during increase. So notice where they put that right about the end of World War II. Right. And so you see, here's the trend line. So the trend line. This is the point I was trying to make in this graph. This graph really portrays it. Is that the and again, it's it's saying here this trend line should actually be moved back because there's this uh, twenty year. Uh, lag. But in any case, you don't see any change at all here. You know, if global warming, carbon dioxide was driving, had any connection with glacier recession, you should see a major change in the trend line after 1945, 1950. 
but you don't. It's it's the glacier recession is just continuing to do what it had done for 150 years previously. And how many people really understand that when you talk about glacier recession? We have to put things in context. So um, we'll conclude for now. So but are you are you saying that? I mean, that graph said that primary source of melt was solar radiation. Are you telling me that the sun is melting? I wouldn't glaciers? say anything like that, would I? <laughs> I mean, it kind of makes sense. The sun might be the source of uh, the heat. I kind of, mm. I think that's probably a <laughs> kind of makes sense. Yeah. Kind of makes sense, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Well, thanks, Randall. Oh, great, you're welcome. Great, and I hope you guys don't. Don't mind over the next few episodes, we're going to dive deep into the subject here. No, I, I'm, no loving I'm all it. about it. Yeah. Good. Good. Any closing statements, Brad? We covered the trips. Uh, anything else? RandallCarlson.com for all your Randall Car Carlson needs. Yeah, we'll get into more detail on the, the live shows, but yeah, always check the links and uh, Randall Carlson tours and events page because yeah, there's some new uh, live, stream, live streams being planned. Um, yep. some sacred geometry courses yep. setting up and those uh, getting a new version of the, the video classes uh, starting production with Randall in his new studio there uh, it's going to be excellent to get those those redone so yeah just uh, stick with us lots of things happening for Randall events and uh, also you can still get the Atlantis uh, that was live stream that was done you know you can get that on demand so that's seven hours of good stuff uh looks like on the youtube page that those are still some of the most popular videos people are going back to the very beginning and watching the atlantis episodes Excellent. good yep and i mentioned that the that the sanctuary project the school project is moving forward and we're beginning an active search for property that might be suitable for a project of this nature and we're going to be definitely disclosing more about this as we go forward all right. Yeah. Sign up for the newsletter. Yep. And I'll mention also, we've got some juicy stuff planned for through the rest of the summer and into the fall for what we're going to be doing and uh, the information we're going to be covering because I've decided it's time for more disclosure. All right. Ooh. Mm. I like the sound of that. Yeah. The I've been, get, I've been getting open. signals lately. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Moon, All right, guys. Moon signals. Hmm. <laughs> Where are these mysterious signals come from? I want to <laughs> get flagged. Uh oh. Welcome to flags. All right, guys. Good night. Thanks so much, Thanks, guys. Yeah.